and Managing Director of uh, Tata Steel. A uh, very warm welcome to you, Honorable Minister. Warm welcome to you, Naren. Uh, uh, we have uh, with us today at this uh, uh, program that we are having with uh, between the Horasis uh, and CII. We have partnered for several years, and today at this particular uh, program, at this particular edition, if I can say, we have over 700 participants. Uh, we have registered from 30 countries. Uh, of course, there are. Uh, 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 quite a few from India also, but 30 different countries. And uh, Honorable Minister, there are 75 sessions which are covering themes like the demography, economy, trade, investment, education, technology, uh, innovation, startups, sustainability, family business, philanthropy. Uh, one can uh, so there are lot lots of areas. And I say that because uh, uh, as I was uh, looking at the list of co uh, the coverage of the. Uh, of the different sessions, uh, many, many areas uh, are areas where we come to you for guidance, for, we come to you for counsel, we come to you for your thoughts, and we come to you for your help and support. Some of them do not strictly come on the, the list of portfolios that we, I just read out, which is uh, with you, but we keep coming to you uh, to uh, tell us where we are finding pain points or where we are happy. And you have always been of extraordinary help in terms of sorting out uh, for the industry in India uh, uh, those, those issues. I must say it's been a phenomenal partnership over the last many years, particularly over the last one year and a little above that, when we were in difficult times in, uh, during the pandemic. And uh, uh, while the globe faced a lot of challenges, India also was, uh, uh, was, uh, was initially... Uh, uh, we, it was mind-boggling sort of uh, challenges that came, uh, came, uh, came, came, came to us. But we got together, you led us, and we were able to manufacture things which we had never done before, be it PPE kits or ventilators. And, when, and, and we, we, uh, we started producing. And by early May, we were producing, uh, uh, I recollect, over 200,000 kits a day. And today, 500,000 kits a day. And today, we have become the second largest producer of PPE kits. And there were several, several such challenges that we faced. But well, while working with you, Honorable Minister, we have been able to trans transform those challenges into opportunities and also deal with the challenges of the industry through different, different policy interventions by you and by your ministerial colleagues. So this has been a phenomenal, phenomenal journey. And at, at this point in time, as I just wanted to mention, we have in this particular function uh, uh, several countries which are looking forward to working with India, work, wanting to do business with India, wanting to invest in India. And uh, therefore, it is. Uh, and we have CEOs, we have board level, uh, board level members from companies, think tanks, media, uh, UN, other institutions, multilateral agencies. All of them at this uh, at this uh, program, wanting to have uh, a few questions, and I will pose those questions to you, Honorable Minister and Naren. Uh, so both the government and the industry. And uh, uh, and I must say that uh, Horace has done, Honorable Minister, a wonderful job uh, through Frank Richter, uh, a friend. Uh, who has uh, been uh, earlier associated with the World Economic Forum and now uh, does the Horasis found, uh, 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 as an independent international uh, 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 if, uh, out of Switzerland and Zurich. So I, I think there's been a lot of work that has gone into uh, seeing to it that we are able to uh, really work and, and, and see how we can capture in, in, in the next 45 minutes or so what's happening in India and how the globe can engage more with India. So I will, uh, before uh, I come to the Honorable Minister for his opening remarks and comments, I'll ask Naren, uh, Narendran, the President of CII and the Managing Director of Tata Steel, to give his point of view, his thoughts as to how uh, do you see the Indian industry uh, uh, be, being becoming competitive, how Indian industry are collaborating, how Indian industry would really be able to work closely with the rest of the world. Over to you, Naren. Thanks, CB. Uh, uh, Honorable Minister, Mr. Goyal, thank you for joining us. Uh, CB, Frank, uh, all other distinguished uh, colleagues who've joined, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a privilege to be here today. And before uh, we hear the minister, I thought I'd share some thoughts on India's emerging industry and trade architecture, which is the topic of uh, you know, trade has increasingly become important. I don't think I need to tell you that. 
100 years back, it accounted for maybe 10% of the GDP. Today, it's 25% of the global GDP. And trade has changed tremendously, while manufacturing trade changed with the shipping industry and the containerization of shipping happening over the last 100 years. Telecom industry has uh, globalized uh, the services trade. So in many ways, trade has become more and more important. And I think economies uh, cannot ignore trade. Industry cannot ignore trade. And trade is very important for industry as well because it helps uh, industry scale up because the market is a world. It helps industry become competitive because you compete with the best in the world. And also it helps industry innovate because uh, you deal with people in multiple parts of the world in different parts of the value chain and you learn a lot from them. Uh, so I think uh, it's clear that uh, any uh, government, any industry planning its future needs to think about architecture of trade and industry suddenly has to work with the government to help shape the architecture so that the stakeholders are taken care of. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, globalization per se, I think there's been a lot of debate on it till the financial crisis. Uh, the growth in world trade was maybe twice the GDP growth rate. Since then, it has uh, barely kept up with the growth in global GDP. And there's been a lot of debate. And I think uh, that debate uh, is led by the fact that, not by the fact, but at least by the perception that a lot of people feel left out of the benefits of globalization. They feel that some have benefited, but many have not. And that is manifesting itself into the uh, socio-economic and political uh, situations. Whether it's developed countries or developing countries, I think uh, this view prevails. And there is a need to be conscious of that. The second thing is, uh, uh, you know, even if you look at global supply chains, uh, uh, there's been a lot of uh, consciousness of the risks involved because it started with Fukushima many years back when uh, a lot of the auto supply chains were impacted uh, by what happened in Fukushima. There were floods in Thailand, which again impacted global supply chains as far as the auto industry is concerned. And uh, even off late, uh, what happened with the pandemic. Uh, so basically, global corporates are conscious about the risks inherent in global supply chains. And how do you de-risk by having more options than one as a source? And how do you de-risk by mitigating, by spreading your supply chain over multiple countries. So there are very different views emerging because of socio-political uh, uh, pressures and uh, developments as well as the economic developments related to the risk to, the, to do with the supply chains. India is uniquely positioned because unlike many East European, East Asian economies which grew through exports, India is uniquely positioned because not only can it be a source of the global supply chains or a part of the global supply chains, it can also be a destination for global supply chains. And I think that's something which India offers. It's a large market. It's a growing market. It's a young market. And I think it's a market which you cannot ignore. So I think how is it that we as industry, how is it that we as government can leverage the opportunity that is available to us, not only to participate in global value chains as a source or a participant, but also as a destination. And how can policies evolve, which addresses uh, the seeming conflict between the need to be open as far as trade of goods is concerned, open as far as trade of capital is concerned, but also be conscious of the fact that people cannot move across the world looking for jobs. And hence, you need to create jobs locally. And that's why I think it's important as developing countries and particularly a country like India, where you may have a million people joining the workforce every month looking for jobs, uh, you need to have that balance between doing what is best for the consumer who wants the cheapest product, the best quality product from anywhere in the world, while the job seeker is looking for jobs close to home as possible. You know, so this is the conflict that I think industry needs to manage, government through its policies need to manage. The other thing which is, I think, going to evolve as you go forward is, of course, the role that technology plays. I think today, global trade, global issues, geopolitical issues are being driven more and more by technology issues rather than trade issues. Traditionally, it was trade which was driving geopolitical tensions. Today, we see that technology is also a big factor in geopolitical dynamics. Uh, at the same time, there is also a need for us to, uh, as we develop, as we build industry, as we build new businesses in India to create knowledge intensive businesses, knowledge intensive industries, so that we leverage the knowledge component of the future that is there for sure. The other, other aspect of the future that we need to build in is sustainability and climate change. It's a challenge and an opportunity. How do we have a greener uh, journey to development uh, and how do we create more opportunities through that journey 
uh, how do we decarbonize without deindustrializing? And I think these are things that uh, we need to think about. And I think the policies uh, that evolve needs to keep pace with the expectations of industry. So I think there are multiple challenges ahead of us as we think through the architecture on trade and industry. Uh, you know, the government of India, Mr. Goel is representing the government of India, has over the last few years done a lot on helping the cost of doing business, the ease of doing business, uh, you know, uh, inviting investments into India, making it easier to invest in India, to grow in India and to leverage the opportunity that there is in India. CI is privileged to work very closely with the government on many of these initiatives. And I think Indian industry is also very, very happy to do what it needs to do to work with colleagues across the world to attract investments into India, create jobs in India, and to really leverage the opportunities that India offers, not only as a destination for global supply chains, but also as a participant in global, global supply chains. Uh, the government of India has also responded to the pandemic. I think we are doing more than 5 million vaccinations a day. A uh, lot of stimulus packages have been announced to help revive the economy. Uh, the economy has had been recovering very well till the second wave hit us. And I think things are again getting back to track. There are some sectors which are more impacted than the others, which are also being supported by the government. I think CI as an industry association has been working very closely with our members who need that support. And I think uh, we are confident that we will build a strong and resilient India in coordination with the government. So thank you, uh, Minister, Mr. Minister, for joining us. And with this, I hand over to CB and uh, to Mr. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Naren. Thanks for those uh, remarks uh, uh, about what's really happening, especially from the industry side and how we are engaging with the world and how we wish to engage with the world and this con uh, working about or your concept about India's emerging industry and the trade architecture. That really gives me uh, uh, my my uh, segue into requesting the Honorable uh, Minister to uh, request him to speak about what's really happening. I mean, a lot has happened on the policy front if one sees in India in the last few months, especially in the last few months as we navigated through uh, the COVID. And one of the things that has been very, very clearly which has come out is India's engagement with the world. And in terms of trade, in terms of we have seen investment uh, coming into India, foreign direct investments coming into India, in terms of global value chain, uh, and a and lot of facilitation being done in the, in, in, in the policy front. Uh, so what uh, it would be good for the global community to hear from our Honorable Minister as to what's been happening on the policy front and what more can one expect? I mean, as, as you know, Honorable Minister, more that India does, what happens in the globe is they say they'll mange more. And uh, so, 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 so what is it that you, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we can uh, peep into even at the future as we go along? Over to you, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Banerjee, for your very kind words, a very kind introduction, and a very good question you have posed, which will help me capture my brief opening comments at this plenary session on India's emerging industry and trade architecture. Thank you very much, Mr. Narendran, for setting the context all the distinguished business leaders and other dignitaries who have joined the VC, ladies and gentlemen. I still remember several years ago when a dear friend, Jitain Doshi in Mumbai, had first talked to me about the Horasis Foundation and what the long-term vision of this foundation was, how he looked at creating an engagement amongst countries where the East plays an important role. And uh, India, with its emerging relevance in the global world, becomes the fulcrum of that engagement. I'm really delighted to see the Horasis uh, India being progressing and going from strength to strength. I've had the privilege of addressing you before. And I'd like to compliment CII and Horasis both for this wonderful partnership. COVID-19 has clearly disrupted our way of doing business 
In fact, it has affected the whole global trade and global businesses. At this point, I would like to pay my condolences to all those who lost their lives in COVID. But I do hope that with the collective effort of the entire world, focused A, on expanding the vaccination network, B, containing COVID, should there be an eruption, treating it within the protocols that are available, and finally, reorienting our businesses in this new world, the new way of doing business, will help us overcome this crisis. In fact, as Prime Minister Modi often says, converting this crisis into an opportunity. In fact, despite all these COVID-19 disruptions, there are clear indications of economic revival in India. I'm sure you're all aware that our foreign direct investment in the COVID year 2021 was the highest ever, despite the world figures of foreign investments in other countries falling. India was able to attract very high levels of FDI. This year, we are very confident we'll continue this streak of seven continuous years of historic highs in our foreign investments. Similarly, exports are really looking up. The first quarter of this year, April to June 21, we've had a record $95 billion of exports, something India had never seen ever before, not even in the fourth quarter of any year, which is typically the year where all of us really put in our best foot forward and expand economic activity. This first quarter, 95 billion, has energized us. And we feel today empowered to lay a target of $400 billion exports for the first time ever crossing the 400 billion Rubicon this year, 21-22. And with the support of all of you, friends in the room, I am confident we shall achieve that. In fact, uh, even in July till the 21st of July, our exports are above $22 billion. Well poised to cross $32, $33 billion by the end of the month, which means our run rate is on track to achieve $400 billion of exports for the first time ever. This includes very ex good expansion of our engineering goods export. It also has brought us into the top 10 list of agri produce exporters in the world. And many other sectors which are labor intensive, showing very good traction, very good growth. With this positive momentum, trade policy now needs to be reoriented in the new way the world is working. From ease of doing business to exports, from startups to services, we're taking a giant leap in each sector and working in collaboration with industry, working in collaboration with the private sector to find the right set of policies, predictable, stable, helping India be more competitive, helping economic activity stand on its own feet, removing the compliance burden from business, from lives of people, from day-to-day -day living, removing unnecessary laws, all in all, trying to strengthen India and our position as a preferred destination for industry, investment, and going forward, innovation. This is the result of 30 years and this is the year we are celebrating 30 years of the opening up of the Indian economy. Barely two weeks back, I went and met Dr. Manmohan Singh, the architect of the original reform package. Today, I would also like to recall the contribution of Prime Minister late Shri P.B. Narsimha Rao, who gave him that opportunity to bring in reforms. <coughs> of 
course, as I saw piece by Dr. Manmohan Singh, at that time, reform was, uh, was forced upon us. We had no choice but to open up, given the precarious position of the economy. Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi over the last seven years has consistently been working to bring about structural changes in the Indian way of working, not out of any compulsion, but out of a deep conviction that India's time has come. It's now time for all of us to prepare ourselves to be relevant in the 21st century, in this century, 21st century, where, I mean, I'm not being astrological when I say it, but I really believe that the world's destiny is going to be shaped by a lot of the decisions that all of you and we take in India. India is going to be that pole around which the world economy will need to grow and expand. And I say this, ladies and gentlemen, because in a number of interactions with ministers across the globe, particularly from the developed world, from large industry groups, both in India and internationally, I get the sense that they all recognize the opportunity lies here. Large amounts of money, not liquidity around the world is chasing opportunity. And that's what attracts them to India. Because India is growing with speed. And when I say we are growing with speed, I'm referring to stability, productivity, enterprise, entrepreneurship, and demand. Truly, where is the demand? It's 1.3 billion Indians aspiring for a better quality of life. That is the demand of tomorrow. The entrepreneurial spirit you see in India more than 15 unicorns in the last six months alone? Are young boys and girls not wanting to be job seekers, but job creators? That's true entrepreneurship. Our industry, engaging with the world market with confidence, that's enterprise. India, in the COVID period, working from home, with all the difficulties around a pandemic about which nobody knows anything. We've been able to sustain economic activity, get back to normalcy very quickly, recovered nearly 93% of our economy, got it back despite the very strict lockdown in the first quarter required to prepare the nation to face this pandemic. And demonstrating that through improved productivity, improved processes, we'll be able to be, remain competitive and be a part of global businesses from a position of strength. And clearly, thanks to the people of India, with two consecutive mandates of an absolute majority, First time ever after probably 1984, I think India and the people of India have spoken about their confidence in Prime Minister Modi, the stability that he brings to Indian politics and the stability of economic policy that we have witnessed in the last few years. We have embarked on the path of Atmanirbhar Bharat a self-reliant, self-sufficient, self-confident India. And as Prime Minister Modi says, Atmanirbharta is not about lesser engagement with the world. We want to expand the engagement with the world. We want to open our doors wider to be a part of the world economy. We want trade to flourish both sides. We want services to grow internationally. We want trade barriers from both sides to be removed. It cannot be that one part of the world through various means creates non-tariff barriers but demands an opening up of the other part of the world. Atmanir Bharta, to my mind, is the recipe for rebuilding India, revitalizing India and rebuilding resilience 
in our economy. Ladies and gentlemen, today I would like to share with you a little bit about the last two years of active engagement with the rest of the world, where we are currently in dialogue with 16 countries and in some cases groups of countries to look at greater degree of bilateral trade and in goods and services, working towards early harvest agreements which will allow us to quickly identify areas of mutual interest and progress our negotiations faster towards a comprehensive economic partnership towards free trade agreements. While for any country working on 16 agreements simultaneously is not easy, we have focused our efforts to a few very promising agreements where I can see clearly huge comparative advantages for India to get market access and the ability to trade both in goods and services in a much bigger way. The United Kingdom, the European Union, Canada, Australia, the UAE, all of these are countries with whom we can very quickly expand our discussions, our engagement, look for the low hanging fruits, look for areas which are labor intensive like our agri exports, our textile sector, our engineering goods, our automobile sector, and then of course our evergreen services sector. I think this kind of focused energy that Prime Minister Modi has directed his government to put into bringing in a greater degree of self-confidence that we can engage with the world, but with that part of the world where there's transparency in operation, business processes, policy, economic activity is not opaque, and we get a fair deal on the principle of reciprocity. We have recently announced the production linked incentive in several sectors to create national champions. These sectors where we can clearly see an edge both to meet the entire Indian demand and with growing economies of scale become competitive in the world will help us revolutionize our manufacturing activity. About $26 billion of production incentives covering 13 sectors are going to be paid out in the next five to six years. I believe PLI is not only production linked incentive, it is a powerhouse of leading industrial growth in the post COVID world. I do believe the world is looking at India as a trusted partner today. The world wants India in their resilient supply chains. Just like Australia, Japan and India started the resilient supply chain initiative. Many other countries in the world are engaging with us to look at sourcing in a greater way, in a bigger way from India, making India their partner towards progress, towards competitive international businesses. And we in the government are working towards ensuring a transparent, dependable and reliable ecosystem in India. Be it through the effort I'm doing on a, I often say genuine single window where all of you can sit in your office, maybe work from home and get everything done online without ever having to go around government offices just like I had to do 30 years ago when I started my first small scale industry. I remember every one of those experiences. I remember every one of those often humiliating experiences. And I promise you, 
we are doing our best and i'm scratching my memory to remember every little detail of what i went through what many of you went through what many of our young boys and girls go through when they want to venture to their entrepreneurial journey to see how we can make a difference to see how we can provide an enabling environment to help indian enterprise flourish grow expand take india across the world make india a recognized brand but in all of this i assure you transparency integrity and honesty will be rewarded very very deeply in a recent engagement with ypo somebody asked me that you know we feel very hassled about agencies coming and troubling us i said look the agencies are not troubling you it's unfortunately the legacy issues which are troubling you it's unfortunately some actions of the past which are causing distress our effort is to move the nation to an honest and very very transparent way of working so that nobody in the future and your and my children in the future don't have to go through the kind of business environment that some of us had suffered in the past our effort is that when a person a young boy or girl graduate from college his mindset doesn't go the wrong way his mindset is trained to think honestly his mindset is trained to be very very if i can use a word and what the youngsters use very cool about his way of working because he doesn't have to worry about intimidating and harassing government processes or business environment when I mean, just yesterday somebody came to me said they want to set up a testing lab i think he was mentioning and he wanted approval for that testing lab and probably being a person of the old school of thinking maybe not realizing as much as how things have changed he didn't know that we have already outsourced the entire activity of approval of testing labs it's a completely online process now doesn't need any minister to interfere it's all on the website he just needs to apply satisfy that he meets the requirements of a recognized testing lab that process is also done by nabl an organization whose leadership is in the hands of the private sector adil zainul bhai an ex mckenzy chief of india runs the quality council of india under which nabl is and the entire effort is to get government out of your life out of your business so i'm just sharing this small example because i do believe that things have changed things are changing very fast in india and this new energy that i see in the country are the key to india's transformation in the future the national mood has changed people are becoming more and more conscious about their rights and their obligations and i do believe we are poised for a very very great future going forward there are a lot of emerging opportunities in the short term pharma products our vaccines our ict related goods and services textiles lot of lot of good opportunities in the short term lot of great opportunities in the long term digitization clean energy our foray into high tech industry like semiconductors gvcs many sector specific opportunities in textiles shipping engineering services marine products electronics lots to be done ladies and gentlemen lots of ambitions lots of goals lots of dreams to be met lot of commitment to fulfill lot of effort we all have to put in but i am confident that today as we stand together with a strong resolve united for a single cause of building a strong india for tomorrow 
no power on earth can stop india whose time has come as swami vivekanand once said when an idea exclusively occupies the mind it is transformed into an actual physical state friends let us take this resolve let us all collectively decide that with our collective energy with the buoyancy we see with the positivity in the market in the country today we will use this opportunity work together put in our best effort and make india become a superpower again help our young boys and girls achieve what is truly destined for our next generation thank you very much for this opportunity and i do wish all of you good health and a very very productive engagement through this cii horasis conference and may your businesses and your lives prosper in the days to come thank you sim thank you thank you thank you very much honorable minister thank you very much uh all minister with your permission if we can have just a couple of questions uh, for for and comments from your uh, based on what I, one is receiving of course uh, based on what you said uh, and you alluded to the 30 years of reforms uh, and uh, uh, india has come a long way since then and you all uh, you also enjoy if i may say a very strong a, 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 a government with a phenomenal strong mandate uh, and uh, therefore it gives you i would believe a phenomenal power if i can say to carry forward reforms at this point in time to make those announcements which many of you many of which you spoke about uh, that some big important steps that has been taken but as we go ahead there are other big areas that one would look uh, like to look uh, for india uh people which we have definitely not touched because uh we don't want to touch those areas be it labor be it land your government started working on the labor reforms uh you in a noisy democracy like india there is always a pushback but you 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 run most of the states in the country now and and these are reforms at this point in time many of the reforms Uh, are really related to the states of the country rather than the central reforms as we go forward how do will you ensure that this leadership which has been taken by the center gets translated into the states which will actually make india so very competitive and engage with the world so much much strongly uh, can't the uh, can't uh, the uh, the party uh, your party uh, which rules so many states in india can they take the leadership of making those reforms happen in the states what's 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 the way forward sir yeah, something that we'd really wanted to hear from you uh, uh, in, uh, and your perspectives uh, thank you cb and thank you hit the nail on the head there's a lot that we desire to do that's a lot that's in the pipeline both at the central government and in several of the states run by us you alluded to labor reform while we have already pass the law to combine all the various debilitating labor laws into four codes which will also give a lot more flexibility to the indian labor market and actually expand the labor market expand job opportunity we are negotiating and finalizing issues and you know how it can be with the unions we have all worked with unions uh, we all had uh, had to bring everybody and bring a greater degree of consensus and the labor laws were actually a result of extensive deliberations with unions amongst political parties and have by and large been welcomed by all but at the same time several states uttar pradesh for example gujarat madhya pradesh they've already done large part of that reform within the state so it's a two way track that we are working on our states on their own are pushing the reform agenda we at the center are trying to create the national consensus to bring it in but i must share with you sometimes uh we we often uh, we, uh, sometimes we just go about the same complain if i may use the word about an issue which may not necessarily be on the ground i've been a minister now 7 years Uh, mr panaji i have yet to meet one person i promise you 
not one industrialist or businessman who came to me and said that because of labor laws, we are not investing in India or we, our businesses are suffering. The last that I heard of a problem of labor was the Winstrom factory one. But there it was a contract not paying the workers full wages. And as principal employer, the company, probably being a foreign company, did not realize its obligations. They should now they have they have realized that they have to supervise and ensure that even contract labor gets paid. And all of us in India know that. As principal employer, we have to ensure that. Other than that, if you look back, many years ago there was a problem in Maruti. And even more. Looking back probably a decade ago, a problem in Bajaj Auto. I have not heard of labor problem in India in the last 10 years, so much so that it could become a deterrence. Narendran is here, the largest industrial group in the country. I have not heard of a single instance of a problem. Of course, they are a fantastic employer. But by and large, you be fair, labor will never be a problem for you. Similarly, land. I have what 22,000 hectares of land in the industry parks alone under NICTE. We took out a database of the land available in the states and the center. It runs into lakhs of acres. Land available for setting up new industry businesses. It's possible that for a particular business at a point of time in a particular area, there may be some resistance. It's often politically motivated. Or often uh, not 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 really uh, marketed well or explained well. So there may be some instances. But otherwise, today land, labor, capital with so many venture capital and uh, other private investors, banks much stronger than ever before, having cleaned up most of their balance sheet. So I think land, labor, capital these are issues which we could discuss maybe. 10 years five ago or something. Today, we've been able to bring all of that to a little bit of stable picture. And if anybody has a problem, I'm always there. My doors are open. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very, very reassuring. And yes, your, your doors are indeed has always been open for the industry and for everyone. Uh, uh, and that's that's been a hallmark of this government. And I must say that with, uh, with, with the experience that first one has had. Uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 before I uh, end this session, uh, we cannot but talk about what's going on in the world. And in India is no exception, COVID. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, 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 more often than not, probably, we get a raw deal in, in the way things are seen. When it comes to, say, for instance, vaccination, uh, uh, people do not. People look at the percentage vaccinated, not the numbers vaccinated in India. Uh, that's the raw deal that we get. And it, vaccinating in India is a huge challenge. We have a population of 1.3 billion, and we are doing and we are doing our best. But the economy uh, depends a lot. After the first first uh, first wave, we turned around pretty much pretty much well. After the second wave, we, we turned around even faster. Uh, so, but we we want to prevent the third wave. We want to, and and vaccination would be one area uh, to see how uh, how we can really uh, mitigate the challenges that come through a third wave. Uh, so, the world would like to, and it will be great to understand from you, Honorable Minister, what's India doing in terms of uh, uh, in in terms of vaccination? What's the story? How's the story evolving? How happy are you with with the progress? And uh, how do you think that you will be able to deal with? Any other economic challenge that might come uh, come our way in the months to come? Well, uh, you hit the nail on the head. Vaccination is very critical to our uh, turnaround. And uh, actually, India should be proud. All of you should be proud that we are the world's largest vaccinator, if I may use the word today. 42 crore or 43 crore vaccines already administered. Our run rate is now 12 crores or so every month. Uh, soon become 15 crores uh, in the next one or two months and possibly go up to 20 crores by the end of the year, uh, calendar year, per month. So by December, almost every adult would have had a single dose. And uh, most of us would have had second dose also. So I think this is something India should actually be proud about rather than uh, 
you know, demeaning ourselves. Leave alone the politicians, of course. That's that's a different uh, story. But look at the other part. When vaccination started, recall the vaccine hesitancy. Even today in Delhi, which is a very enlightened city, 20% of the frontline workers who started getting vaccinated six months ago are not yet vaccinated. 20% of frontline workers. Even today, there's a lot of places where there is vaccine hesitancy. Look at the private sector. You all demanded, and I remember how much you all fought with me on VCs, including the day we announced opening up for the private sector, the, that afternoon or that evening. That open it up, let the private sector do it. We did open it up. You know, not even buying all those 25% vaccines. CII should take a lead and get all of you to ensure that you take those 25% vaccines. And you had all said, we will do, one industrial group said, I will do one crore vaccines. Another said, we'll go to remote areas, rural areas, and we'll do it. Nobody has gone to Bihar. Nobody has gone to the Northeast. Nobody has gone to Jharkhand or Chhattisgarh to run campaigns uh, to remove hesitancy and use the 25% that's available for the private sector. States made a clamor, allow us to run our own vaccination plans, import it. Prime Minister allowed it. Then they started screaming, why did you um, leave it to us? Center's responsibility. We took it back. So it's a responsive government you're dealing with. I mean, I, I can almost say you guys are driving our agenda. <laughs> so we are going along with you. But please also then calibrate what you are asking and then fulfill what when you get what you are demanding. <laughs> but don't worry, our government is committed to provide a free vaccine to everybody eligible, irrespective of whether the private sector does take your 25% quota or no. We will ensure everybody gets vaccinated. We are, of course, strengthening the ecosystem of uh, hospitals, ICU beds, uh, ventilators, oximeters, then the 1500 uh, plus. PSA plants, pressure swing absorption plants that are being set up all over the country. The Tata Trusts are doing an excellent job in strengthening medical infrastructure all over the country and many other philanthropic organizations. I compliment all of them. I particularly have a word of, uh, I must mention, for the steel industry and the refineries that in the second wave, they were absolutely fantastic. That's truly the symbol of private sector and government working hand in hand to serve the people of India. Steel plants cut down their production to be able to give more medical oxygen to the people and the hospitals who needed it. Refineries scaled up their liquid medical oxygen. One uh, refinery in Gujarat, which used to be barely 100, had a capacity of 100 tons of uh, oxygen liquid oxygen a day, ramped it up to 1,100 tons within a span of 30 days and are now looking at ramping it up to 2,500. And the story is the, is the same in every aspect. Testing, rapid testing, PPEs, masks, uh, medicines, oxygen, hospital infrastructure, ventilators, ICU beds, you name the thing. India's Transformation or growth in all of these has not been, cannot be calculated in percentages 10, 20, 30, 50, 100. You only have to calculate it in exponential terms. Testing from 2,500 to 25 lakhs a day. PPE kits from zero to net exporter to the whole world. Medicines, the world looking up to India as the pharmacy of the world. Today, even rapid testing kits, we are exporting. Oxygen from seven or 900 metric tons of liquid medical oxygen per day ramped up to 8,900 per day. 10x. No country in the world, no country, I dare say, has been able to do that. Vaccination. The developed world, and of course, then the politicians will come and say, look at the percentage. Obviously. 
we have 1.3 billion people. The United Kingdom has 60 million. Now you compare the percentages, it's quite irrational if you ask me. But given the scale of the challenge, I'm proud of all of you. Every single Indian has stood up to that challenge. And collectively under the leadership of Prime Minister Modi, we will emerge victorious both out of COVID. God forbid the third wave does come. We are confident we can face it squarely. We can save lives. We can save our people's uh, future. We can save our economy. And we'll emerge as the beacon of light for the rest of the world. Thank you very much, Sidi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. One last point that I'd like to come to. And before uh, I do that, I'll, I'll just also request, Naren, if you would also like to respond to the Honorable Minister's call that how CII and industry would collaborate uh, with and, and uh, assist uh, in this huge program that we have in front of us of vaccination. But my last question to both of you, Naren, and, to, and I will re uh, request the Honorable Minister for the closing co comments. But one big area today which concerns the world, and India again has shown leadership, and Honorable Minister himself in his earlier avatars have shown phenomenal leadership. This is in the area of environment and sustainability. And I'd like to just uh, say that we, we actually see in, uh, sustainability not just as a compulsion, but also as a huge business opportunity, Naren, given the imperatives for green products, green energy, green businesses, and Indian companies, uh, yours and others, have uh, a notable uptake in uh, becoming sustainable. What, what more can be done in this regard and what could be some of the challenges ahead, Naren? And I request the minister to kindly tell us also uh, in, in, uh, uh, in conclusion after Naren as, as to what does India see? It has shown its leadership. Now what next? Because we have such great challenges and that's a very, very important global issue. And in fact, it will uh, also uh, 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 affect trading between countries uh, uh, very strongly as we go forward. Then on the response on the vaccine and thereafter on the environment. Thanks, CB. And uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Minister. I think uh, your point is very valid. Uh, I don't think private sectors picked up the 25% that is available that I agree totally. But I think uh, CI has been doing a lot of work on this. Many of our members have been picking up and uh, working in the communities, uh, you know, which uh, are around their places of operation. We are doing a campaign also on vaccine hesitancy. We are fully conscious that this hesitancy is a big challenge, particularly in semi-urban and rural India. So we are working, we have a team working on it, and we work with many of the media houses to get some free time to communicate this. Plus, we are also very conscious that in many parts of semi-urban and rural India, we need to work with local influencers to get this addressed. Uh, we are also working in specific states. Uh, uh, you know, Odisha, for instance, we've done a lot of work along with the public sector and private sector and the government. And uh, Mr. Pradhan at that time was pushing us uh, on that. So we were doing a lot of work there. We are working in multiple states. We met the Honorable uh, health minister the other day, CB and me, and he also talked to us about Northeast. So we are working on Northeast as well. So I think uh, CI is committed to work and make sure that many of our members take it forward. I know that our Southern region has done a lot of work with our MSME members and done a lot of camps uh, there as well. And similarly uh, uh, across multiple states. So we take your point and we will certainly push that forward. Coming to CB's point on sustainability and climate change, I think it's a big challenge. I think uh, my submission to you is, uh, you know, we need to have policy evolve at the pace at which we expect industry to change because globally uh, policy is evolving. And as you saw from the announcements from the EU, even over the last few days, there's a carbon border adjustment mechanism. There are incentives being given to industry to transition because the cost of transition and the complexity of transition is beyond what industry alone can handle. So, you know, industry, government and customers, because customers also need to be willing to pay more for green products. So I think between industry, customers and government, we need to work together to manage this transition. It's a great opportunity for us in India. I think renewables is an area where we are already moving very aggressively. But I think on hydrogen, I think whether it's on uh, many other uh, dimensions of it, whether it's carbon capture and storage, I think on many other areas, there is a need for us to work closely with the government. And I think as I, uh, as you may be aware, and as I may have mentioned to you, sustainability is 
an important part of our theme for this year in CI, and we'll engage with the government on this. Over to you, Mr. Yes, sir, I know that this is a subject of your passion. Therefore, wanted to end, end with this with this particular. Thank you, thank you very much. And before I respond to that, I must compliment uh, CII and Horaces. And if Mr. Jorgen Richter is on the call, or please convey to him my compliments for having sustainably taken the Horaces agenda forward. And while listening to CB, I was just looking at your whole event uh, details. It's a remarkable set of subjects. I think if you make a document out of all that was discussed in this, it could actually become an agenda setting document. So my compliments to all of you gentlemen, ladies who have uh, kept this fire in the belly live to make Horace's CII partnership a grand success. So I, I just wanted to really compliment all of you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Narendran, for uh, enlightening us about the good work uh, CII and all of you are doing. I'm delighted that you're going to pick up the Northeast also. Maybe uh, uh, a little note uh, sent on what actions and activities you're doing will help more of us and government be educated about these initiatives and help us appreciate it even in public. Uh, gentlemen, ladies, the Agenda of sustainability is not something that's foisted on us by international pressure or by various uh, COP 20, 21, 22. Now we're going to have the 26th uh, COP at uh, Glasgow in the UK. It's, uh, as Prime Minister Modi says, it's an article of faith for every Indian for centuries, probably from mythological times.